Welcome to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal, where our goal is to change the way you practice dentistry by helping you achieve clinical, financial, and personal balance. Now, here's your host, T-Bone. And welcome back to another episode of the T-Bone Speaks podcast. We are so excited for today's guest, and we're so excited that you are joining us again. Uh, so to our loyal listeners, we want to thank you very much. And just like cable companies, we want to give our new listeners more love than our loyal listeners. So <laughs> we have all the specials and discounts are for the new listeners, and our loyal <laughs> listeners get nothing but higher bills. So uh, before we get into this week's guest, I want to turn it over to Meredith, and uh, Meredith will talk to you about everything 3D. Hi, everyone. Before we get started with the podcast, I do have a review. So if you haven't left us a review, make sure you head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave us a five-star review. So this one says, T-Bone highlights all aspects of dental business and more in the Can't Miss podcast. He brings his entertaining personality while offering insightful advice and information that is helpful to everyone who listens. How kind. That is so <laughs> nice yeah so well, so i got i don't know how to do my borat voice but apparently he's coming back i don't think so he is coming back on amazon prime oh okay yeah yeah man borat's coming you must be really bored if you're gonna watch that i don't know who has that kind of did time. you not watch this is america from sasha baron cohen last year a couple of years ago it's so good i don't watch a lot of tv so to good. keep up with your your shows. I'm sorry. I think it's your job to keep up with what I do. I know <laughs> pretty much. So, well, before we get started, I have an update on the 3d side of things. I just want to make sure everyone is aware and knows what's going on. We do have a live patient implant program. Uh, we provide patients for you to place implants. This is in Raleigh at our training center. And what is unique about our course is it's all taught a digital workflow. Yeah, absolutely. So this week, I think Thank you, Meredith. Uh, thank you for reading the review. Our dog has decided to join, join us. us. <laughs> so we you hear him. Yeah. And uh, so if you do hear him. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, listen, the implant program is fantastic. It's taken us a few years to kind of get it going, but uh, it's it's a big focus for me. I really enjoy it. And I think uh, our guest wants to talk about live patient stuff too. So uh, yeah, I have to add though, it's already taken off for 2021. So if you want to get in on that, yeah, so we're already almost full for the beginning of the year. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad. So uh, our guest this week is Dr. Chris Adland from, well, I think you're from Portland, Oregon, <laughs> but you're not. You're really from Vancouver, Washington. So like I've got the state wrong, the city wrong, the whole deal wrong. Right? Geography. Geography. <laughs> not our strong suit. <laughs> you know, when I say Vancouver, Washington, no matter how many times I say Washington, everyone always assumes it's Canada. So I always So get... they talk like this? Yes. <laughs> no, I think a that's more Midwest, right? A yeah. <laughs> Apparently uh, accents also. Yeah. <laughs> we should go ahead and... <laughs> should we do that the whole show? Well, Chris, welcome back. Thank you. This Appreciate is your second weekend here? Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Are you really excited? I actually like... am. I'm more excited for this weekend than the last time. I'm not going to lie. I mean, <laughs> holy smokes. You're here for like five days this time. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, I'm attending CE with some of my best friends, which always makes CE so much more fun. And, um, and we get to do live patients, which I don't think there's any CE better than that. Talk to me about that real quick. Before we get into you and everything, yeah, talk to me about live patients. Yeah, you know, um, obviously right now things are a little strange with COVID and we're doing a lot of webinars. Um, mm -hmm. A, it's so nice to just be in front of people again and working with people. But as far as education goes, you know, you can do so much on Benchtop, but when you're in your operatory, it's so different. And if you can go and you can learn with a live patient in an operatory setting, it, it makes you take that experience home and how you relate it. So the whole time we were in there and we were doing surgeries mm -hmm. last time, we were doing extractions and grafting and you warned me that you were going to push me and I almost cried several times. But <laughs> I, I made it out alive. No, it was actually really awesome. That makes uh, me sound like a... Welcome, <laughs> welcome to our life like every day. <laughs> was making us cry. Uh, no, it was, um, it was amazing because there were mentors in there. There was security. I knew if I, you know, if something was going to happen and I was going to get into trouble, then I had help there. Um, but someone looking over your shoulder, putting your hand on the instrument that was supposed to be there and 
And then the best part for me, like I'm very passionate about giving back and we got to give back yeah. to some pretty amazing patients. The patient that I saw, like I just wanted to take him home in my suitcase because I wanted to help that him That would more. be illegal. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. where you would also so probably where you're, like to go. <laughs> but where you're from, that's allowed. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, bring them all in. We take them all. So uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's it's fun. You know, live patient, live patient education has always been uh, super important for me. Uh, not, not from a business side of things, that certainly it's important there too, but uh, it's really how I learned to do dentistry. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly in dental school, it's all about the live patient stuff, certainly, right? But even like if I go back to my first CE experiences, some of the most uh, fruitful and most impactful ones uh, were my live patient cosmetic ones I did at LVI with Bill Dickerson uh, back in the early 2000s and you know some of those live patient programs and like I'm going to do the sinus one with Justin uh, I was supposed to go last weekend but we had a class so I couldn't go last weekend so I'll try to go early next year and uh, because I want to expand my skills and there's only so much you can do on typodonts there's only so much you can do on pigs mm -hmm. but you know doing it on living and breathing patients uh, is is important, I think. And so I think, uh, especially on procedures that you're uncomfortable with, you know, that's I, I, that's why I think it really, really shines. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, uh, so I think you're going to be trying to do some live patient education next year, too. I'm sure looking into it. I'm very excited. Sure looking into it. Why, <laughs> why, why do you hide it? Just, I'm going to do it. I am. I'm going to do it, and I'm really excited to... Yeah, I'm excited um, for you. Thank I you. Think, I think you're going to do great at it. Thank you. I don't, I don't think you should hesitate to do it personally, so... Uh, let's talk a little bit about Chris. Tell me, tell me, tell our listeners who is Chris Adlin and a little bit ba of background on you. Perfect. Well, I grew up right outside of Portland, Oregon, about 20 minutes north of that. Um, grew up in construction, so my background was running heavy equipment, and dentistry was super random. Uh, I lived with a hygienist who loved dentistry, and she said you'd make a good dentist, and I kind of gave her a weird look because I thought dentistry. Is that kind of like when you told Meredith she had a great face for radio earlier? <laughs> I did not tell her that. I told her she has an awesome radio voice. <laughs> Like, I just want to sit and listen to I'm, her. I'm pretty, What's wrong with my radio face? I'm pretty sure that's what you told her, just so no, you know. No, there's no mixing words here. Girls stick together. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, we do for sure. Oh, guys, we stick together. I don't, know. Sure. I don't know about that. <laughs> You're outnumbered on those Yeah, one. Can't wait. Yeah. All right, so, so you grew up running a backhoe. Yep, and uh, got and into dentistry. Lips, yeah. Had no idea what a crown was. Was really excited what a bridge was because that's what we built. Um, and turned out it was something much smaller. And but I fell in love with working with people. That was always my strong suit. So you know, got in and got into the sciences. That was fine. But when I got to actually work with the patients and make mm -hmm. a difference with my own hands, I fell in love with it. So engineering was my background. And um, when I graduated, I had an associateship, and he was kind of known as a cowboy. And he did his own surgeries, and he was into Sarek. Sarek we didn't have when I was going through mm -hmm. school, so it was something very new, but when you got to work with your hands and you produced it and you had that ownership. Well, you did you graduate dental school? 2006. Okay. Um, it was it was amazing. And as a young doctor at the time, too, when patients saw me use the machine, this is back in the red cam days, mm -hmm. so of course it's a little different than our prime scans now, but patients kind of gave you that instant authority. They were saying like, oh, wow, I mean, if she can run the red cam especially, right. then you well, know what you're doing. I think that's always the beauty of technology. You know, technology, whether it's as simple as an Apple Watch as simple as a phone or as simple as, you know, maybe even TVs, right? Like smart TVs or smart speakers. I think there's always this thing where if you utilize technology, people automatically assume you're smarter mm -hmm. and that you're more cutting edge and people want to be around that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, I'll always argue that we built our practice on technology. Uh, certainly, it helps that we have good people running it, but uh, running the technology part. But uh, we built our practice around that. I would say the same. I did a startup in 2009 when everyone told me I was crazy. Yeah, it's the best time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Had nowhere to go but up. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I started with Sarek. I started with Galileo. So I was uh, one of the first GPs to have a CBCT. And everyone just thought, oh, she's going to go bankrupt here in a second. Yeah. But we saw emergencies. We did same day procedures and took care of people. And that's what got recognized and expanded. And I've been growing ever since, which has been a fun yeah, journey. Yeah, you have two offices now? I do. I have two so offices. You're supposed to tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, all the dentists 
just want to hear the dentist stuff, just so you know, okay? <laughs> they they want to hear, like, what, tell me about the dentist stuff, okay? <laughs> so the dental stuff. So um, obviously, I'm super into CAD CAM. I right. love it. It's my passion. Um, I think Sarek is one of the most humbling experiences of being a dentist. I will never forget my Patterson rep was taking me around, introducing me to doctors, and he said, I would never see another doctor who wasn't a Sarek dentist. And I thought, well, that's just a sales pitch mm-hmm. if I ever heard one. But when you get into it, and like you do, it it is incredibly humbling. Like you see your own work, and if you can own it and say like, well, that crown broke, I will never say I never have anything fail because I but, do. Of course. <laughs> um, and you, especially you know, with your dentistry. I know, right? <laughs> Um, You know, you look at it like, why did it break? Was it material choice? Did I do something wrong? Is my prep bad? And you start to learn all those nuances. I think it's almost our prep's bad. I agree because people don't look at it as a milling strategy. You know, they look at it. I mean, our labs do a lot for us. Well, I think I think uh, I think our labs hide a lot for us. Yes. Because, you know, here, here's, again, for me, the biggest thing with Sarek was I learned that I under-reduced oh, like yeah. crazy. And and part of that is because I've never taken calipers and measured the crowns I've got back from labs. And, and I would ask any of our listeners, any of you listening, when's the last time you measured your with your calipers, your occlusal reduction or how thick your ceramic or zirconia crown or PFM crown, whatever it is. Nobody's doing PFMs anymore. But if you measured how thick that was, right? And I think labs just hid things for us. Mm-hmm. And when you see the big blue bubble on on you know on your CAD software, it really uh, it opens up your eyes to my goodness, I thought I reduced a lot. And yes, milling strategies and some of those things come in to the little bit of blue, right? You can have a little bit here or there due to milling strategies, but when you have really good blue, you know, light blue there, that's usually not a milling strategy error. That's usually a um, that's usually a prep error is what I'm seeing. I agree with that. Yeah. You yeah. learn how to prep and... Yeah, you learn how to prep, you learn how to get good margins, you learn how to get a lot of things your lab's just just hide for you and they don't want to lose your business so they don't point it out to you. Yes, so. they don't want to tell you you're bad. No. Because <laughs> they want your business. No, they yeah, don't they want... they want you to come back. <laughs> yeah, they, no, of course they don't want to tell you you're bad, right? Right. You know, they will when it's really bad mm-hmm. or if you're working with uh, uh, certain labs that are notorious or well known for being very specific or when you ask for the feedback and uh, that that's always important as well. So uh, let's talk about this. Um, I want. I'm, I'm trying to do a series where we're having people talk about their their biggest advice or their one main piece of advice uh, that they would give to somebody. In other words, almost in a sense, if you could turn back time and re, you know, really refocus on this one area or really understand this part of your career and career is personal and professional. Uh, this part of your career, uh, what would you what would you tell people? So I kind of want you to kind of go into that. Yeah. So I think, um, I'm a big believer that there's different seasons in your life and Mm -hmm. personal life and dentistry. And one thing that I really see that I think dentists get kind of pigeonholed is, is you want to do what everyone else is doing. And when you ask someone like, why do you do that? Well, it's because that that's, that's what we do. But but why is that? So, um, for me personally, I got out of the gates. I got involved with Sarek. You get involved with this really good group of people and everyone pushes each other, which is fantastic, but you feel left out if you're not doing endo or you're not placing implants. And so I dove head into everything. I wanted to do everything, wanted to be good at it. Um, and I had time, like when I was young, time was my asset. So I could go through that. But as I really started to evaluate and my personal life changed and all of a sudden I didn't have as much free time. Um, I realized I was starting to look at my schedule and like for me personally, I had placed implants and done surgery and I would not want to come to work. I would just start sweating. I would get angry. I'd get mad. I would just get really, really anxious. And it wasn't So fun. you got anxious when you didn't have implants on your schedule? No. Or when you <laughs> the opposite <laughs> of you. The opposite, which I know is uh, so <laughs> ironic that I'm sitting here at an implant course. Right. Um, and I... I took it upon myself. You know, I was reading a lot of books and business books and like really wanted to find out, write down. I'm a big person who likes checklists, like what was going to make me happy in my day? For me, it was restorative. And I loved single centrals. I loved painting and staining and glazing and all of it. And I loved to just own my CAD cam. But when I'd go back and hang out with my friends, like they loved surgery and I had to like whisper, like, I just have a restorative practice. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, I was so embarrassed by that. But, but why? Why would you be embarrassed but by But why? Exactly. Um, I felt like I was... Yeah, I'm part of the cause of people being embarrassed <laughs> yeah. by that. We talk about it a lot on your podcast <laughs> when I'm driving. You don't know it, but we do talk about it. 
um, you know, I felt like I should really be doing everything and I wanted to love what my friends were loving and the profit. But the truth is I had a really, I have a profitable restorative practice and I'm happy with that. And I've met my goals. And if you do it well and run it like a business, you can do whatever you want. And the fact that that's my passion, that's what made me grow. And I've brought that in. Um, now I, here I am 10 years later and now I have a new set of friends going through placing implants and you know, my day, um, my day got very, it was the same. I mean, all my cases are different and you get to really impact those lives and I enjoy that part, but now I just needed something new and something refreshing. So that's why I'm going through this journey again. And, and technology has changed a little bit with implants. And so for me, it was gateway getting back into implants with my fancy implant in a box. <laughs> yeah, well, well, well for, for me, selfishly, one of my goals is to get you off the crutch. And that's why I'm here. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, I, I want you to have more control of your implant process. But circling back, uh, because um, I, I don't think we we disagree very much on this. I always believe you have to be passionate about what you do. You have to avoid um, the fake book and Insta Famous. You got to avoid all those things, and and really, you have to do the soul searching about what makes you happy. Now, what I deal with, or why I'm a big believer that you have to move beyond restorative dentistry. Um, and it's not about you. Ultimately, I want people to be happy. And, and, but I'm saying as a practice and a business, you have to move beyond restorative dentistry. And whether you're the person that does it or you bring in somebody that does it is because it's really the way to make your practice grow. And it's really the way to, you know, we can price ourselves only so high, okay? I think 99% of us can price ourselves only to a certain degree. There's that 1% dentist, the APAs, whoever else there may be in the world that can charge 100 grand for restorative dentistry, okay? But very few of us can do that, right? There's, there's, there's price elasticity where the price does matter at some point. So at some point you have to sell things that are on a time basis, more valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm a big believer because if we look at dentistry, okay, the most profitable dental practices are surgical, orthodontic, you know, and, and believe it or not, pediatric practices. Uh, those are some of the most profitable practices. So my thing is, why can't we get GP practices to bring more of that internally? And... I'm a believer that the owner of the practice has first right of refusal in terms of doing that stuff. Now, if they stink at it or if they truly don't like it, then they shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just look back and, and look, I like doing some of that. I don't like the single tooth stuff as much as you do. I am not nearly as good as you are with it. Um, well, I, my ego will say I'm not as good at it because I don't apply myself as well <laughs> as I We could. knew there was a butt coming. <laughs> no, I could be great at it, just so you know, right? But um, is is I like doing that stuff, but I will say it holds me back. Okay, it holds me back from uh, in maximum profitability, and profitability and productivity for me is not a function of making more. It's a function of working less. And so being able to have half a day off today to spend with JP and go do stuff, to be able to take a whole day off with you guys tomorrow, to be able to go to the spa and go to play golf and have lunch and have dinner and do all of and those yes, things. And yes, this is part of the digital implant <laughs> continuum. <laughs> golf We're going to be working tomorrow <laughs> together. Yeah, you know, but I will argue uh, till I'm blue in the face that the solo single provider restorative practice doesn't have that level of flexibility that I'm referring to in most instances. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's my, that's my fear for dentists who get stuck in what they're doing or, or I hear people that often will say, well, I need something got to be different. And, and you have to do something different to, to expect different. And so. if you want to grow, you absolutely have to do something different. Yeah. I, and I don't disagree with anything that you're mm -hmm. saying. I, um, I just, I don't want people to feel bad if, if, I mean, like for me, like I wanted to faint at surgery. Like now I'm having more fun right. and I'm enjoying it. I, I mean, I think I made reference earlier, like the last class when we were yeah. doing extractions and grafting, I was 
much more terrified of that than dropping screws. Yeah. <laughs> that like the implant part is fine and exciting. And actually drawing blood was probably the scariest thing. But once we <laughs> did it, it was such a high. Oh my gosh, it was so fun. We were like dancing around celebrating that yeah. we got to do it and had a blast. The um, easiest thing. And yeah. Yeah. And when you signed up, when you, when I talked to you on the phone the first time you were like, oh, by the way, I don't like blood. Yeah, I may faint. I was like, <laughs> okay, it's fine. We'll figure it out when the, we get the, there. The, 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 the the best salesperson will, the, yeah, you, we, we don't have blood. In no our, blood. There's no blood in our classes. What? In our surgical classes, I didn't there's say no that. blood. I didn't I know, say I there's no blood. Just... I said, it's fine. We'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> and we did. We did. We conquered it. It was Let's great. Let's make sure the check clears. Yeah. Then, we'll, then we'll figure it out or whatever. Oh, that's good. So, so let, let's, in a nutshell, what, what are you basically saying? Uh, is don't be, don't get caught up in social media, essentially. Do what makes you happy. Just do what makes you happy. It's like, it's just follow that goal golden rule. Um, take ownership for what you do and live it and love it and, and then be adaptable. So for me, so I had my growth and my restorative practice. Um, I did it for 10 years. I had great average growth rate and then I hit a, a plateau. Yeah. And so, okay, now it's time to do something more. Now, what is that? So then it, it was getting back into implants and I'm, and I am excited at this point to be doing that again. Yeah. And you know, the, the plateau is where, is where I like to start pushing people. And see, part of it is, is the plateau occurs for multiple reasons. Some of the plateau occurs because you've literally mastered what you're doing and there isn't the market or you, there isn't um, more that you can add on. But for some, the plateau occurs because they literally are stuck in basic restorative land. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I will always say this is, as a traditional restorative dentist, you can make a phenomenal living. Mm -hmm. I have two associates and they yeah. are restorative and they kill it. Right. And they make a great living, yep. right? But they also know their limitations. They know what makes them happy. And for them, and I'm not trying to say this any disparag disparagingly, for them, dentistry is probably a means to an end. You know, well, you know, in, in their, in their phases of their lives, they both have little kids and yeah. they want to come to work and they want to go home and, yeah. and that's awesome. And I know in a few years, I mean, I want to help them do whatever they want to do, whether if they want to go into ownership, if they want to just, you know, do what they're doing now, I'm not there to judge. I'm purely there to help. And I appreciate working with them every day. So, but I don't want them to feel bad about that. Like, yeah, absolutely. No, we all, we all need, we got to have some cooks in yeah. the kitchen, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. we can't have all chiefs. We can't all have chefs, right? You know, uh, that's the surefire way to have things not work. Correct. You know, well, thank you for bringing that up. Anything, any more arguments you want to do with me? Because <laughs> you made it sound like you wanted to argue with me. Wait, well, before we argue. move on, I do have to say, Chris mentioned that she talks back. This is a Chris's first time on the podcast, yeah. but it is not her first time conversating with us. She talks back to us in the car. Does anyone know? I need a poll. I need a poll. <laughs> How many people talk back to us? You need a poll? A poll. <laughs> a poll. In conversation. Sometimes I will, you know, just shoot a text yeah. to actually talk, but it is really fun to have the discussion in my head. I always win. Yeah, of, yeah, of course. course. Of course. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> yeah. As you saw today at dinner, I always win. Yeah. But like, no, like I, so look, I think um, like one of my biggest, how do I say this? I, I have a few fears in life, okay? My first fear is uh, my fear of disappointment. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid of disappointing the ones I love the most. Um, and not in any specific order, but kind of in order, uh, would be my dad, my parent, mom, my parents, okay, uh, my wife, uh, my kids, and then my team, mm -hmm. okay, and then my friends. And so I, I have a, a big fear of disappointing people. So it, it really, that's, that's always important to me. And, and uh, so part of my, the, my other fear is a fear of, of doing things that nobody likes, you know, like sometimes I wonder if people like the podcast, right? They love your podcast. No, well, the five people that listen love it. Okay, <laughs> but um, but there, there's that innate fear of course. that that uh, does this episode suck? Does it not suck? Or you know, so what are you talking? What like what gets you? Like what about like so? Like earlier you said, okay, I took it very offensively. Earlier you said the best part of the podcast <laughs> is when Meredith reads the reviews I'm like like that's a brainless part of the podcast it's just I'm not he's saying he's calling me blonde no I, I, I did not that. say that brainless I said, it's, and blonde it's literally you're like reading hey it's hard to a cracked screen okay <laughs> whatever it is you're reading like there's there's like anybody like anybody can do that it's not even about Meredith but it's it's literally just reading what other people wrote she meant she likes to hear what other people have to say about how fabulous it is it gives her chills knowing that she's your friend 
Absolutely. Oh my God. Uh, no, actually, uh, yes, that too. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to argue with that. That is absolutely correct. But um, I loved how you did it, and it was mm. a great segue into what we can we, we should all be doing in our practice. Like, why aren't we sharing your reviews more? Like, someone yeah. can go on Google and stuff, but like when you're saying it out loud and hearing it, or mm-hmm. if you post that screenshot and put it on your Facebook or your Instagram, like that is really yeah. powerful to have other people read it that way who aren't searching for it. And I see that trend now more in the social media, but when you're actually talking about it, it's great. So uh, here's a couple of tips for people. So I want you to stop your car right now in the middle of the road. I'm kidding. <laughs> Pull over on the side of the road. Um, people often wonder about what to put on social media, right? And what I want to tell people is the one of the best things that you can put on social media is you can take your reviews from your Revenue Well, Smile Reminder, Lighthouse, whatever it is you're using, your Google reviews, your Yelp reviews, and you can make quote images from those things. And then you can, then, you know, like for example, we have roughly 300 Google reviews. Is that the number? Like 300 Google reviews? Mm-hmm. Can, More than 300. Can you, can you just double check so I know? <laughs> so when everyone else um, is Googling right now. I don't want everybody else to call me and say you only have 125 Google reviews. <laughs> Dipshit. Um, but, I don't know, but I got a Google review at the office about a couple months ago and I haven't worked there in a year. <laughs> So, uh, 344. So, so that's 344 44 image quotes, mm-hmm. right? That is a year's worth of social media content that moves the needle. 413 on Patient Connect. Right. So and that's our revenue, revenue well site. Well, yeah. So that's 700 some reviews that we can literally turn into quote images mm-hmm. And we can recycle those. It's not like you have to use them once and done with it. You know, people have to remember social media, the stuff you put on social media literally lives for anywhere from 60 seconds, depending on the type of social media you're using, to maybe six hours. And then it's gone. And that roughly 10 to 15% of your base will see them. So you should recycle those things. So uh, I would take a Google review I would um, turn it into a single quote image. I would take a Google review and turn it into a word video. In other words, where it comes on and and that way it's a video because algorithms pick that up better. And then I would take a review and I would do like what, what what I have Meredith do. I would have a different team member read it saying thank you to that person. And that way, so that one review just turned into three social media posts, and then we can take that and times that by 300 and some, and literally that's three years worth of social media posts that actually matter. Not the stupid boomerangs that all of you guys do, me included. Not the, you know, stuff like that, because I, I think that, yes, that show's fun, but I think reviews, testimonials, I think those things really move the needle. Very few people will pick your practice because you did a cool boomerang. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I got some pretty cool ones of you yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think patients are coming in for that. Whatever. But uh, (laughs) but people will choose your office because of your unsolicited reviews and test and reviews are yeah. just another word for testimonial by the way so I love the sound bite part of it that's something I haven't done before but yeah that's just a have great... different team members right yeah that sounds and fantastic. just literally take your phone and just say hey uh, this is Dr. Chris I want to thank Martha so much for her great Google review Martha said this Martha I want you to know we love you if you're looking for practices just like this please call Adeline Dental yeah you know and that's three years worth of content and we got to stop worrying about what to make up. Mm-hmm. You know, Agreed. that's so... So anyway, with this podcast... You could make up reviews, though, if you don't have any. <laughs> you could. I mean... You could have your mom <laughs> leave them. Yeah. My son, you know, most of the time he's pretty good. But sometimes not so much, you know? That kind of thing. All right, your on. poor mom, she'd be like, he cancels my appointments all the time. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. All right, let's move to our next segment of the podcast, okay? Uh, in this segment, I want to talk about what's working in your practice. So what, what's what's working well in your practice right now, Chris? You know, uh, coming back from COVID, I lost uh, pretty 
handful of people, probably think five team Did members. Did Antifa get them? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah we, it's scary around Portland. You got to be careful these days. Um, Why is that? Did they go into different fields? Some people just didn't want to come back to dentistry. Uh-huh. Some people... Um, Moms, kids, at home. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Family life. Yeah. Um, grass is greener. Some other opportunities. Uh-huh. Um, other opportunities, you mean other dental offices? Other dental offices. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have really struggled on... I don't know if it was this way, but on the I've, West Coast, the hygiene okay. wages, like skyrocketed and so yeah. we had they were already high out there they were they already yes and then people are asking like in Seattle their hygienists were asking for $70 an hour they didn't buy a dentist for that much I, I, <laughs> and it's you know it, uh, you come back in this crisis and you're trying what to what I say wrong <laughs> we, <laughs> buy a dentist uh, yeah. we're just gonna ignore it <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry I lost my train of thought on that one uh, I, bet, I asked that because this is, seems to be very common I think I don't it is. think you were the only one. I think a lot of people lost a lot of team members. And it um, devastated. I, I took it really personal. personal. It 100% devastated me. And we changed our whole schedule. We were five days a week, two associates at all time, four or five hygiene. Um, and now all of a sudden I don't have hygienists and um, we just kind of rearranged our schedule. So I went from five days a week to four days a week, which really solidified my team and okay. hired a couple new people and it changed the culture a little bit, but I will say I've never had as strong of a team as I do now. And it was hard for me to think about it mentally because I've always been on a big growth trajectory mm-hmm. and now I feel like, okay, I'm taking a step back and I'm a huge Excel nerd. So now all of a sudden my numbers aren't going to jive and like compared to last year, they're going to be different because of production. Well, your top line numbers won't jive. Your bottom line numbers probably will. Yeah. And you know. we're becoming more efficient. And now that our team is working more cohesively and we've changed flow for COVID reasons, but actually it's working out really great. And we've had to have a lot of hard conversations with the team members to make sure everyone feels safe and what's happening like with what, patients. What are, what are some of these hard conversations that you're having with team members? Um, a lot of it comes down to fear and safety. So, um, you know, if you have a team member who wants to go out of town or wants to go to church or be in a gathering, are they allowed to, which, you know, I can't really tell someone if they're allowed to or not, or if they come back and, you know, their great aunt may have been exposed to COVID, then do they come back right away or do they get tested? And sometimes we can't get tests and sometimes you can't get the results or you can't get the results. And then, and you know, it's hard if you have a hygienist who has a full list of patients and we're mm-hmm. already trying to get people in. And now for two weeks, she's going to be out. Like luckily patients are a little bit more resilient these days and can adapt to it, but it still, it hurts the bottom line every time. Yeah. And, and for us, like in my mind, I worked a lot during the time, but, um, team members were off and then, but they already had vacation plans. So we come mm-hmm. back to work and they're like, well, I'm, I still have my vacation plans. I need that time off. And then you think, Oh, okay. You just I had mean, three months off, right? right. And, and that's what yeah. we're feeling, but they're feeling like, okay, the world opened and they haven't had time off because they've been with their families and right, helping kids in their school. And, and yeah, yeah, like they want that freedom too. And so it's just, um, there's been a lot of reevaluation of life and trying to adapt to that and coming up with new policies at work and what we're going to do. And, and them knowing too, like, here's our bottom line. Like we really, if we're going to stay open, this is how we got to do it. You know, interesting, I'd, interesting thing I'd like to build upon what you just said is, is I have pretty much, minus that two-week period we just talked about in an episode recently, <laughs> <laughs> I was running the office again, which sucked. Um, I haven't been doing hardly any hygiene checks for two or three months now. Wow. Um, and minus when we have three hygienists running because I'm there. Then I'll do, I can't have Shaw do three hygiene checks. I mean, I, legally I can because I'm there, but that's just, it's not great. So, um, and what I found is I can keep my schedule full without the hygiene checks. Well, yeah, it's always easier without hygiene checks. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about <laughs> his restore, his, my, my his workload. Feeling. Yeah. Like my, like my. Filling his schedule. My schedule. It's. Most yeah. of your work, a lot of your work though comes in through consults, I would say. Well, right. And that's what I, my point being is, yeah. is that, is that I believe that. I don't want to say I believe, but we have been tricked into believing that general dentists have to have to have a hygiene driven business model. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm hopeful for is that COVID showed people that general dentists don't have to have a hygiene driven model. I'm not saying that we should all get rid of hygiene because that's crazy, but I'm just saying that. I talked to many dentists who said, wow, my production was one third 
of what it used to be during COVID because they were still seeing emergencies or whatever, but I made as much money as I did before. Because you didn't have payroll. Because you didn't have the same amount of payroll. You didn't have all the things it takes to support everything, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the question is, is that a sustainable model? I believe it is. Yeah. Um, I, I absolutely believe you can run a dental practice without hygiene. Um, but I think that hopefully for most that COVID has, hopefully for most people, COVID has opened their eyes to different ways of doing business to achieve a, a bottom line that meets their needs and then some. Or better. Or better. Right. And then some, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so to me, that's, uh, I, I, I'm very interested in seeing, to kind of build on what you said, like you've adapted because you've lost some people mm -hmm. and then you found out that, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah. You know, maybe I won't have double digit growth or maybe I won't have triple digit growth. I mean, I don't know who has triple digit growth, but, <laughs> but you can at some point, but, but you will have a better practice lifestyle without costing you money. Maybe you won't make as much, but as you mentioned, we get through seasons of life where we just don't need as much, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, I call that your forties. <laughs> Welcome to forties. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so I do, I, I'm a big number tracker. I love the business of dentistry. And one thing that uh, definitely affected me in COVID is when we came back, we were doing virtual exams. Mm -hmm. And so we would sit in our ops and we would check with the camera and um, we weren't doing the hands on touch with our patients. And we definitely have a very hands-on practice with our patients. They all feel like friends and family and um, our treatment numbers went down significantly right. and our acceptance rate went down significantly. So um, we had to go back to seeing patients and actually doing exams. And I mean, we're talking a 32% swing. I mean, it was a pretty big That's swing. Big. So um, it was interesting to watch that flow because we kind of thought no one would really want to see us. But at the end of the day, the patients, they were not walking out the door scheduled. Yeah. And, and we kept saying, we don't want people to stop at the door. Like, just keep going and we'll call you or we'll do right. text to pay. And we had all these super creative ways. But when we ran the numbers and looked at it, it didn't work for my practice. We're, we're a high touch business. We are. Mm -hmm. And people want, and people coming back in, like they haven't had connection and people want connection right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I felt, I think our patients, uh, all the patients felt like that was a safe place. Of course. They knew that we ramped up PPE and just every way of we doing masks things. masks anyway. <laughs> but it, it feels clean. Every way of office. doing things. Yeah. And you know, those, uh, things at the front desk really, right. <laughs> really protect people. <laughs> so they just felt safe. And I think they thought if they could go anywhere, that's where they could go. And they were like, well, if I'm going to catch it, it's going to be at the grocery store, not at the dental office. So. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I just go about my business. I mean, I just, you know, every day. All right. So along the same lines, we know what's working well for you. Mm -hmm. uh, where Where is Chris struggling? What's a struggle for you right now? Well, um, I... And by the way, that's what people want to hear. What I, I'm, I struggle mm -hmm. all the time, every day. I'm very <laughs> open about that. Just feel free to email me, call me, text me. Um, so I had this vision and this kind of will ta tie into goals um, that I really wanted to buy smaller practices and take my knowledge and what I've done and work with new doctors, bring them into that practice and show them the business side just because I don't see there's a lot of exposure that necessarily to that in dentistry, um, the clinical side kind of mentor them up and then just, you know, they can decide, do they want to practice or purchase or um, just be an associate? And I kind of had this plan and business model that this, I could do this. Um, I enjoy that side and I enjoy mentoring and teaching. Um, but it has kind of kicked me in the butt. <laughs> like what about it? Um, I thought I knew my numbers really well, but, um, buying a practice that is not an owner practice versus having just a pure associate there, you have to add another 30% on top. Mm -hmm. And so if you have young doctors who aren't really super strong producers yet, mm -hmm. um, you want to mentor them up, but they're not going to come out of the gates producing necessarily 30% over the cash flow of your numbers when you yeah. purchase that practice. So, cause I have to pay that. I, so I pay my associates 30% of Except, production. Yeah, that's pretty much standard. Pretty standard yeah. Right. Um, and I, I, that's not how I looked at the numbers. I looked at the numbers as if I was coming into the practice and I used my associates figures, but it was, I didn't really take in the consideration mm -hmm. that extra production number. Right. Um, so, and then also, is that I, how you've ended up with two? Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I have it and it, there she's growing and she's doing well with it. Um, 
but it's taken a lot longer than I expected. Yeah. And I am definitely a lead by example. And I'm not in the office as much as I, I, I had this vision like, oh, I'm going to be there once a week and help coach. And you still have to pay the bills and still, make, you, make right. your money in your place. Yeah. And it's easier for me to pay in my practice than it is to go over and work in that practice. Yeah. And so, um, that w- it was definitely a learning experience and, and I, I still love the idea. Like I would have loved someone to take my hand and teach me how to do it. And I kind of had the opportunity. He had a second practice and I just got to go in and work it. Um, but but I, want you, I want you to think about what you just said, Chris, the, your personality wasn't going to stick around with somebody for very long. Tell me what that means. Like, so like somebody you would you would have loved to have somebody hold your hand oh, but how long would me you have as an stuck, associate how long would you have stuck around <laughs> like I hold people's hands for a long time if you're my no, friend <laughs> no no but how long would you have stuck around and I think oh, I think yeah. scale is the problem for most of us okay because well look I, I've worked with some DSOs I've struggled with my own scale things and the first thing my wife and my parents told me, my dad told me when I tried to bring on associates, and associates is a level of scale, okay? Whether you're doing multiple practices or bringing an associate, it's scale. It's scaling. It's adding another person. And it's never as efficient mm-hmm. as, as you because you clearly get your vision. You clearly know that you can outwork others. You know, you clearly know what you got to do. And these other people, as good as they are, as bad as they are, they aren't as committed or as vested as you. And quite frankly, they're not as smart as you. Because if they were, they wouldn't be where they're at for a long time. And that's why DSOs have that turnover every few years. Mm-hmm. And they're built around that. You know, they, they have figured out a way to deal with that turnover and they have figured a way how to scale down the overhead of the other 70% minus the 30% that you, that you give to an associate. They figured out how to scale that down so that they can do it. And also, the big mistake that I think happens with minds like ours is that we feel that other people can scale the same way we can. And... By and large, and this is not uh, this is a generalization, but by and large generalization, most DSOs scale on traditional bread and butter, basic, what we refer to as basic dentistry. They don't scale at specialty procedures. They don't scale at sleep. They don't scale at GP-driven uh, implants. They don't scale at GP-driven ortho. They don't scale at GP-driven endo. They may have the outlier super dentist that does those things, but scaling at that level is very difficult. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, what you do takes somebody else two people to do. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just, it's, it's uh, human nature to a certain degree. And uh, I think that's part of that struggle is, and then the realization has to come. Um, well, I think we should talk about this for a second um, because it's one of the things that I'm going through myself or have gone through. I know my answer. Um, well, I think I know my answer. It changes, but, <laughs> but I'm pretty certain. My, I'm pretty certain my answer is, um, if our goal is to make money on the exit, we're more valuable with 10 $1 million practices. But if our goal is to make money along the way and have a great lifestyle and a career, we're better off having one $10 million practice and it's worth less. It doesn't make any sense to me, but it's worth less. And I think, um, I think we will see... Uh, a lot of um, single solo dentists that try to open one, two, three, four offices struggle and close more than we'll see them grow into four, five, six, seven, ten locations. So I think um, I think that's what we'll see in in dentistry soon. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely an uh, um, ego bust. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not over, by the it's way. It's not over. It is. But, it is not but, over. I'm, but, I'm but, learning a lot. But hopefully it's an... How much is enough? Oh, and I agree with that fully. No, I'm not questioning you. I'm just saying that to people. How much is enough? At what cost? And 
And look, and I and I've told this to JP. I've told this to other friends. I've told this to myself. You cannot scale if you're going to continue to be at the chair. You just can't. Yeah. You know, if you want, if your love and passion is to be at the chair four days a week, you can't scale. I'm just telling you, you can't. There's not enough of you to go around. There's not. Yeah. You can't be everywhere. You can't. I mean, you can't. How how are you going to mentor people if you're stuck smoking enamel? (laughs) I use a lot of water. (laughs) There's no smoke. (laughs) So, uh, what's a two to three year goal for you? Where Um, Where does Chris see herself? In a few years. Yeah. So I'm at that fun season right now where I've been practicing for, geez, like 14 years. Um, I had very specific goals of where I wanted to be with my startup practice. And I I hit the goals and now I'm um, realigning my goals. Uh, Part of that is now, so I was definitely four or five day. I mean, I just worked until I needed to work. Like I worked until I needed to get it done and that's been my asset. And I paid off my loans. I really wanted my loans paid off in a certain amount of time. Um, which allows me a lot of freedom now. And so now my goal is I would like to work three days a week and then do other avenues. So, mm-hmm. you know, I love to teach mm-hmm. and mentor and. Are um, you down to three days a week? Not yet, but I hopefully, uh, hopefully 2021 is my, my year. Why That's, 2021? Why not now? Because I like to start on a January 1st. <laughs> I <laughs> just, better. <laughs> so OCD like that. I don't know. And it's just something about this year of 2020. Um, you should talk to my wife. <laughs> yeah. No, not no, because I do need a lot of psychiatric help. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> she made me take the month of October off. Now it didn't work. Uh, well, look, Meredith. Uh, let's go back to that. No, but let's look. I've worked less. I think you worked more. No, I didn't. I so I love this because you always say you know work smarter not harder but yeah. you are one of the hardest working people I know and so mm. I think it depends what you define work are you defining work being chair, chair side. side chair side chair right side. but you still work like well, you have a lot well, of like I believe my chair side work is holding me back from achieving my potential and my real calling okay um, I firmly believe that I, I believe that every minute I spend at the chair with patients, I'm disproving everything I try to teach people. When you see him on Saturday and Sunday, he is going to be a different person. Those will be our clinical days of the live implant patient program. And he's just a different person than he is in the office, at home, working, any other place he can be. It lights you up and feeds you. It does because I'm feeding others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing and teaching. And you get to get back. Right. Yeah. Like that's it's what, all, it's oh. all of it. Right. And, and so, so. I mean, yeah. he's like literally cartwheeling through the hallways. <laughs> yeah. If he could cartwheel. <laughs> yeah. If I could cartwheel. I just got that. Can we watch you try? <laughs> just got Can I put it on video? We're going to have to try that. <laughs> yeah, on no, I, I, well, my challenge to you is why wait till January? And here's why I say that. Why not prove that it works before you start January 1st? So, truth be told, I have a. There pretty- we go. Here we go. Here <laughs> yeah. The end of the year is hard. Though. The end of the year is hard though, because that's a busy time. Yes, it is a busy I'll, time. I'll tell you why it's more important to do it. But keep going. I mean, if my associate who works with me, her name mm. is Lena, she's amazing. If she's listening sure. right now, she will tell you that I do work three days a week right now because of my travel schedule. So, <laughs> sure. uh, so we are kind of testing it out. But yeah. I also know. I mean, I need to produce a little bit, and so I just have those goals, and and we'll see. Well, my argument is going to be this. I believe we're overscheduled. I agree with your argument. But no, no, no. When I say overscheduled, I mean even having patients on the books is overscheduled. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, never mind. I don't agree. This is where we disagree. This is great. Yeah, so (laughs) I I believe we're overscheduled. And and I'm telling you, I worked in October with nothing. I started the month with nothing nothing on the books. And you would have never been able to get any of these cases in. And I will produce, I, I bet you I'll produce in October pretty close to a normal month. And I started with nothing on the books. We decided. Only Wednesdays. Yeah. We decided in the middle of August that I was going to work three Wednesdays in October and nothing else. And what I'm seeing is that we're overscheduled. And I'm not even talking about a second column. I'm just talking about being scheduled. Like I want to move to a model where I'm no more than 50% scheduled because I know it fills. 
And it sounds so awesome in theory, but it is like, that makes my heart race, not having a plan. Like you do what, have a plan. You have a plan not to have a plan. No, yeah. no, no. Let's talk about this. Meredith, you, you get what I'm saying? No, I, I, I it, just said it. it I said out. you would have never gotten these big cases that you just yeah. did in October. Because we said he can only work these three Wednesdays in October. We have this big program for 3D. We have a lot to focus on. We want to get 2021 started. We want uh, Plus, Dr. Fiza get- to come in and take over the office a little bit, show some leadership. So he needs to stay out of the office. The only way that's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. And we said, okay, if big cases come in, or only cases he can do, he can do them. Well, that turned into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> no, like I went in today and let's see, what was my day today? I, uh, I started the day and I placed two implants. Uh, then I delivered two implant restorations. Then I did a post-op on a couple of implants. Then I took an upper and lower hybrid impression. And then I saw a couple of ortho patients and none of this was scheduled. And I had a pretty productive day. And actually, right. last week, he had nothing today. It said Dr. A out. Right. But he had, he had two patients Wednesday morning. I said he can't see Wednesday's patients. Yeah, we have spa appointments. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> does sorry. not know that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, so it's okay. They'll know tomorrow. So I said he can't see those patients on Wednesday, but he can see them on Tuesday. So when they moved those two patients to Tuesday... They let the rest of the day fill but, in. But even then, see, see, but but I think I, some people are going to think I'm talking cuckoo because I can see it in your eyes. You think I'm talking cuckoo. I understand the theory. No, but you, you build. Think I'm a, you build a. I think you have built a different practice than no, most people. No, like no. but like we said earlier. That's why I built a different practice. Most of your patients aren't coming through hygiene. No, these aren't. I, I, you're right. You're right. Uh, but I, I want to take, I want, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt. Okay, yeah, but no. <laughs> Should you put the hand up? I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking. Sir, that I'm wasn't speaking. us. That wasn't sir, us, I'm sir. Speaking. <laughs> sir, I'm speaking. I just want that noted. Yeah. <laughs> it was not us. <laughs> that was not us. No, no. I'm, you know, you guys know I'm making fun of, yeah. of the vice presidential debate um, <laughs> and Saturday Night Live, which was even better. The way- <laughs> um, you're right, Meredith, but those all the yeah buts and the excuses people give, oh, he has a different practice or he's able to do it. You've or, built a different practice. But I've done it because I've been willing to have that level of belief that, like, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy that I've blocked my schedule and now more and more, I'm moving more and more. And look, that makes me happy. For the time being, okay? I'm moving more and more to a schedule where it's filling with only the things I want. Like literally nothing else. Now, in a normal week, let's say I was booked Monday and Tuesday like I should be, and now you're coming in town and I want to cancel my Wednesday patients, where the hell am I putting them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to book them out. You can't. It's you got to book them out, or, or you, you squeeze them in, yeah. or you work late, and it becomes a spiral that just drags your practice down. And so, one of the concepts I teach in our mastermind uh, that I teach in our coaching, I just try to teach my friends or people that people that I talk to is, or anyone that will listen. Anybody that will listen, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty Sorry, much I had to. the squirrels that uh, have to go outside and talk to the squirrels is. Uh, if you want to be successful, now this is predicated on not being a startup. This is predicated on being a mature practice. You have associate. With, with mature skill levels. I would not even associate. I don't think the associate matters in this situation. I think it's a great way to prove the need for an associate. Um, but if you have a mature skill set, I believe you should not schedule any day more than 75% full. I think you should purposely leave open time and... It, it'll fill, and not just let it fill, but be so sacred about what you put in that time spot. Like this lady I did two implants on today, I would have made her wait a month and a half. Yeah. But we got her in, right? Because we had that opening. Because we are, you know, I, I, I don't, we're just, we did, October turned out this way because 
I was bitching about something and my wife said, why don't you just not work? And like you said, we, we've reached a financial, I don't like the word freedom. Freedom means you literally can do what you want and we can't do that, okay? Correct. But we have flexibility. Like if you had to take a month off, you could take a month off, right? You know, we have flexibility uh, to make financial decisions. And so we have the flexibility for me literally not to produce for the whole month of October and I'm going to end up producing and... And yes, I probably I've got, more, <laughs> possibly more, possibly more. Um, well, if you count next Monday, I'm doing a double arch. That's awesome. so, so I'm doing a upper lower yeah. hybrid. So yeah, I'll produce That's more. That's still part yeah. of October. Yeah. So if you weren't by yourself though, um, mm -hmm. I think there's two Who would see all those other people? Right. And like who is going to do the fillings? Who is going to do the basic Hygiene checks. Yes. And then uh, one of the things that, so my last name is Audlin, so I have two A's. So I totally have this competitive advantage, especially with plans. And so I, I appreciate that. Because you're definitely the phone book it. first? Oh, correct. <laughs> the yellow pages the, and that the nobody insurance, watches. So that makes no, sense. Yeah, insurance yeah, is yeah. huge. And I'm on a wow. lot of plans. And that's just something that was, uh, it's a personal decision that I choose mm -hmm. to stay in. Your Raleigh Dental Arts. And mm -hmm. so when people come in, they want to see Dr. Odland because then they're, they feel mm -hmm. like, oh, I get the doctor because mm -hmm. my name's on the door. And that's something, if I was to build a practice again, I honestly probably wouldn't, I maybe would use my name because I have double A, but I wouldn't encourage You put your name because you have an ego, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't even about ego. There was marketing with the double A, but um, to get patients to be able to have more flexibility, like I have patients that will only see me. Lena has patients that mm -hmm. will only see her. And, and we do have a good mix in that too, but it would- it Took time to build that up because her name's not on the door. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like um, I feel like it's scary thinking that, there may be a small revolt if I have patients who are like, no, I really want to see. And I love those patients. Great. Like, I'll, I see, too I'll, see you in 12, I'll see you in eight weeks. I know. Well, we build, we, we do block scheduling. And so we sure. actually have those blank spots filled in. But, you, but you're doing block schedule. I get it. Okay. I'm not saying you're not. Start leaving 20% of your schedule open. Yeah, I'll try for you. I'm <laughs> Try one month. I'll tell you You're what. You're going to have to have a place to put all these implants after Listen, this let, course let me tell this you, weekend. Let me tell you, the most important month to do this is December. Which is the scariest month because people are it's, packing it, in. It's, that's why you should do it in December. Yeah. Because you know save you'll Save room for it. the good stuff Dude, and save those fillings listen, for we January. Had, like, do you remember you were working in the practice? Yeah. There was like three years or four years ago, we had the shittiest month I've had in years. Like years. It was in October. I remember it very well. It was a September, October of 7, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what year it was. It was the shittiest month, excuse me, the worst month we've had in a very long mm -hmm. time. And we worked hard. hard. I hate those months. And let me tell you what happened. We started pre-booking all our fillings and we basically... Couldn't fit anything else in. There was no room to do anything yeah. else that actually made and money. And you're tired. Right. And it was when we were super busy in the spring, we didn't want to book any fillings. Yeah. We wanted to have a great summer. So we booked everybody's fillings when they came back for their six month. We're like, oh, they're, they're fine. We'll do them in six months. Well, then we get to September and we're full. We had booked everybody's fillings out. We probably had a monthly meeting in March where he yelled at us and said, <laughs> no more fillings, no more fillings. So we scheduled everyone's fillings six months out. And then when we got to September, we couldn't add anything. Yeah, and my we month couldn't was, move anything because those had been scheduled for six months. So these people, when you call to move them, they're like, "But I've been scheduled for six months <laughs> for a DO on 13. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I'm telling you, the month to do this, okay, the month to try this is December. All right, that's not very far away. Right. Okay. But I'm just, if anything from this podcast, from my end of things, okay is leave empty space in your schedule, not your second column, okay? Leave <laughs> Don't even tell third. me you have a second column. Yeah, <laughs> leave empty space in your main column. And I promise you if, you, if you stick it out long enough, you'll do better. You will, because it will fill with root canal crowns versus fillings. Okay, or single crown or whatever that you know, whatever it is. Like you do endo. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Does your practice do endo? No, we refer out most of our endo. I started with a cone beam. Look at his eyes. I know, but do you know how much failure I see? He's just with watching. My cone <laughs> he's just watching money fly out of your ears right now. <laughs> okay, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> we don't love it. Yeah. If I had an associate, how many have you it? done? How long? 
I couldn't tell you the last time I did endo. Right. So how do you know you don't love it? I'm starting with implants. Just one no, baby no, step at a time. No, I, I get it. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. But what I'm anyway, anyway, I don't want to argue so much about that. But anyway, what I would say is it takes me an extra 20 minutes to do a molar endo if I'm already doing the crown prep. And that's significantly more profitable. And then mm-hmm. the implants and then the it's it's absolutely amazing. I've done more cosmetic cases in the last six weeks than I did all of last year. That's awesome. Right, but it com- it's, I'm telling you, it all stems from being open and yeah. available. Especially cosmetics. When people want that, they want it now. They want it for their daughter's wedding. They want it before next month. I, I, don't, I don't know, how, and, and I'm not even marketing it. Our marketing hasn't gone out since pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, we do that magazine. I don't know if you've ever seen it or you see it at the office. Yeah, But um, uh, we haven't done it since pre-COVID. And I don't know, I, I don't know how to explain it to people, but if, if, if you're a bold person, I'm pretty shy, <laughs> but you're a bold business person, I, I, you know, you are, I know yeah. because of the things you say, you're a bold business person. I would tell you to be bold and block your December the whole month. And only book it out a week in advance. Okay, my associate's going to be ringing up any time <laughs> to talk sure. to you. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Your patients are coming January and February. Yeah. Listen, it's not your fault they waited so late to do their crappy procedures that aren't as profitable. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's I. I agree with all of your points. Anyway, I'm I'm belaboring the point. All right, <laughs> I got a, I got a new thing. Oh boy, we got a before pot. we wrap it up. We have a what's it called pod pod decks. Oh, are we picking our own or are we going to pick your you, own you answer? Pick. Oh, you're not answering too? No, no, no. You're the guest. Oh. You're the guest. <laughs> I'll, I'll back you up if you need me. I'm okay. And then I'll, I'll read you. it to you. Pick two cards. Two cards. One. Will you read it like Josh Austin reads his I don't, reviews? I don't oh, know. yes, please. <laughs> How did he do it? <laughs> yeah. You have to act like the person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, question number one. If everything in your house had to be one color, what color would you choose? It's so easy. It's Tiffany blue. Like yes. if you hold up a Tiffany's uh-huh. bag, it's that color. It's is my that, office. Is that yeah. like Cartier blue? No, yeah. Cartier's red. No, yeah. Get your designer no, straight. Tiffany blue. Tiffany. You know what Tiffany, like Tiffany box. T- like Tiffany store. Like aqua. Like kind of like your shirt. Blue. Like that is the color of my entire office. That's like teal. Your shirt's black? Y- your shoes blue? <laughs> no, the, the color of your logo. <laughs> the logo. <laughs> All right, Tiffany blue. <laughs> Tiffany blue. It's like a turquoise blue. Right? Okay, next girl, girl's trip where let's go to breakfast at Tiffany's okay. in New York City when after, after, after COVID. COVID. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Done. Okay. Second We're question is, what yeah, do you sure. think is the most unpleasant sounding word? I know what Meredith would think. <sighs> That's more Megan. Say it. You say it. Moist. Oh. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> I knew that's what you were thinking when I said Megan. <laughs> oh. Chris, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, email is fantastic. Um, what is it? It is Chris Odland, DMD at Gmail. So K R I S A A D L A N D D M D at gmail.com. And social medias? Social media, Facebook, Instagram. I answer all of them. So I'm going to, another challenge for you before we go. Okay, tell me. Challenge number one. No, no, there's been like 10. No, yeah. no, no. Another, I said another. Oh. Not a challenge. I said another But then challenge. you said number one, so it's Ano- Yeah, because I'm going to do two things. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, is I want you to have your own Sarah course next year. Okay. Okay. Uh, on anterior aesthetics. Thank you. Yes. And I want you to have one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. Okay. And uh, I need you to make it happen. I need you to stop doubting, stop overthinking, and just do it. Your work is beautiful. Thank you. And we can give back to patients in need at of the course, same time. That's always there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the easy part. I think that's the easy part. Okay, that's the easy part. The, the hard part is putting yourself out there to fail. That's yeah. the hard part in all of this. Is like we're starting to see now in our own live patient programs. We start. I, my my initial fear was, will we be able to get the patients to support the classes? And I think we're starting to see that the patients aren't as big of an issue as I thought. Now it's a matter of will we get the dentists to support the patients? And I think if we continue to do what we're doing, that'll become a non-issue as well. And uh, so I, I I think you got to put yourself out there. You have too much to give. Um, and uh, you've held yourself back and suppressed yourself enough. I, I really believe that. So, thank you for that. 
All right. I appreciate it. Anything else, Meredith? No, that's it. You sure? Well, thank you guys for letting us rant and rave. <laughs> and thank you, Chris, for coming on. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for being in Raleigh. Hey. I'm so glad to have you. <laughs> Poor Love girl. It. She's going to sleep in the 65 degree room tonight. <laughs> we don't know how to turn the AC off. <laughs> In our, in our VIP 3D dentist experience with the bunk bed, Meredith's like, don't tell me. Not people. available. <laughs> However, there is spots in the course available. <laughs> you can reach out to me if you have any questions about the 3D dentist courses. It's Meredith at 3D-dentist.com. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal. Remember to keep striving for excellence and we'll catch you on the next episode.